So Jordan, you wrote a piece, a situational assessment in the wake of the Trump election that went kind of viral and so what I'd like to do is kind of recap some of what you've talked about in your latest one, the 2019, and see whether the overview that you put forward at the time of the Trump election, that it was going to be a revolutionary or it was already a revolutionary war, and that this was about the different phases of the insurgency versus the existing structure, what you've called the blue church. And if so, where are we in that, hmm. in that frame? Well, I think it, since I went ahead in 2018, 2019 and asked that question and answered that question in the affirmative, I'm going to go ahead and stick to my guns and say yes. Taking a look at the, pers at the event, I would just to take the event of the Trump election and endeavoring to make sense of what was going on in the context of that particular event. Um, I'm coming at it from a perspective that it's, it's taking place in a larger context. So within that larger context, I can take a look at what that particular event and say, hmm, there's some, some things that I notice that I would like to point attention to. And in, in, in that pointing attention to, I identified four things that I, were calling, I was calling fronts. So I used the, the metaphor of war. And the proposition was that, in fact, it was really more than a, a metaphor, that perhaps we're actually experiencing something that is a closer to war than, say, politics. Uh, although you have to reference your von Clausewitz to go deep on that notion. So, um, in the context of there being something akin to a war going on, and what might that war look like, I identified four distinct fronts that, if you were to watch those fronts, you might get a better sense of what's happening, and maybe even a better way of, of making choices, of, of acting. Um, and the fronts had to do with, one relationship was a relationship between the... Uh, the media, the, the mass media, and the emergent media. Uh, another front had to do with the relationship between what I was calling the insurgency and the deep state. Uh, the next front had to do with globalism and the relationship between globalism and what next? Question mark. Uh, and then the last had to do with this uh, co conflict at the cultural level um, that I identified as being between something called the blue church and then something that I was naming the red religion. And if you recall, which I'm sure you do, I uh, just sort of found those terms sitting out on a, uh, in Reddit and said those are really good terms for what's being described here. And particularly, I like the nuance between church and religion that many people sort of gloss over. So if you walk down those fronts, uh, and they're obviously related to each other because it's a war, so they're part of a larger complex. If you look at the first front from 2016 to, to contemporary, I think it's not particularly obscure that it's a front. And the notion of, what is it, fake news is the enemy of the people is now has been an explicit statement, which it wasn't in 2016. And that evolution has continued. And the notion of there being a, an antipathy, a natural intrinsic deep separation and conflict between something, the mainstream media, whatever we may consider that to be, and something else, this notion of the insurgency, whatever we may think that is, uh, I think is, to be perfectly frank, quite obvious. Right? There's certainly something going on there. Now, that by itself may not be, in fact, fully disruptive, but the notion that you're starting to now get real salvos being fired across this uh, divide, and the degree to which the underlying legitimacy of the mainstream media has now been quite significantly undermined. I mean, I would say that the, the amount of legitimacy that it had in, say, Rush Limbaugh followers in the late 90s, I think has moved into sort of 55% of the population. Like, it's assumed to be biased, deeply, deeply biased with an agenda, and now it's assumed to be biased and incompetent. It's not a very solid foundation upon which to build something. So I also predict that this war is more or less going to go this way. Now... In the, in the larger context, of course, the frame is that there's many, many different things that are going on that are deeper than what we're seeing. And that we have to look at the deeper stuff to really make sense of what's happening. And one of the things that I pointed out in that, in that particular series was this notion of media, the way that different media generate different landscapes upon which these kinds of conflicts can occur. And the, the metaphor of, uh, are you fighting in the desert? Are you fighting in the jungle? And if a certain medium that produces jungles is replaced by a medium that produces deserts, then people who are optimized for jungle warfare are gonna find themselves in a desert and are gonna be in deep trouble, right? So it's 
watch what's happening underneath and then see as the battle shifts. And the proposition, of course, is that a big piece of what's happening, a very big piece actually, not the dominant piece, but a big piece is this transition between centralized broadcast linear media, most notably television, to decentralized symmetric, oftentimes nonlinear, non, uh, uh, what is it called? Not temporally uh, continuous media, i.e. what happens, what you see on the internet. The internet has discontinuous, discontinuous news, different, better term for it. Asynchronous, asynchronous. So when I'm watching a television program, there's a, a, a flow to it that is happening moment after moment. And my ability, think 1977, to go into the bathroom and come back, I've missed something. There's something that's happening that is objectively in a flow. Whereas on the internet, of course, that's not the case. I just hit pause. Or even I just hit close, come back and hit open again. Right? So there's a different thing going on there. So you've got very, very, very distinct underlying media uh, topographies. And these give rise to massive shifts in the stuff that happens on top of them. Right? So that's the, one of the, the deep theses, or at least one of the deep theses that are driving this story. So if you come back up, well, what is the insurgency? In some sense, the insurgency is people who have figured out how to use this new medium to accomplish their ends. It's just the equivalent of uh, you know, the Viet Cong figuring out how to engage in guerrilla warfare in the jungles of Vietnam to actually fight to a standstill the World War II era-ish American army. And that's that kind of idea. So it's an insurgency playing in this new battlefield honed to the new characteristics of this new environment, playing against people who are designed to fight the old war. So it's fait accompli that eventually this side's going to lose. And as we're watching it happen, we can see the breaks occur and see as the sand keeps getting swept out from underneath the wall, how does the wall crumble? Does that make sense? Yeah. So then you move to the next stage, uh, the next front. This is the front where much more of the energy is actually taking place from my perspective. And that has to do with something between the deep state and again, the insurgency. There's different language that I've used to describe it over, over time. But here, when I, when I talk about the insurgency, I want to be clear that there's a broader sense of that. So there's a con concentrated sense, the Trump administration. But there's a broader sense, which includes other kinds of things. Like in 2019, I called out the IDW and QAnon are part of that phenomenon. Um, you know, the, the Donald on Reddit is a part of the insurgency. And while it's named after Donald Trump, it isn't causally linked. He doesn't control it, it doesn't control him, it's just happening. And I would say it has more influence and impact and is more fully of the essence of the insurgency than the administration itself is, for example. So the conflict between the deep state and the insurgency is of the same sort, except in this case the deep state is deeper. It has a lot more going on, a lot more capacity, a lot more um, degrees of freedom with which to operate. And we might even say in many senses the mainstream media that's happening up here is an aspect of it, deeply connected. They're not one-to-one, -one, but they're deeply connected to each other. So here we're talking about a whole broad category of, of uh, institutions and bureaucracies that have the characteristic of lifers, you know, people who work there for 40 years. And so they tend to know each other. And then when you add to the, the fact that they tend to know each other because they've just been living and working in the same kind of place for a long time and have a certain affiliation with the institutional structure they're attached to, say, for example, more than a broader context, um, you add to that the notion that they actually have, over the past 70 or 80 years, begun to develop personal relationships. They marry each other or they marry each other's siblings. And so there's a, a meshing that happens among uh, the, the context of this, this cluster of things. So I'm talking about a place like Harvard and the relationship between, say, Harvard and the State Department. Right? There's a lot of cross-fertilization, people moving back and forth, and there's even situations where a person who happens to be the head of uh, some particular division of Harvard might be married to someone who's the head of a certain division of the State Department, and this is perfectly normal. Right? They just travel in similar circles and have lots of bonds. Right? So it's a, and it's a consequence, this thing, the deep state, which has a relationship with institutions, bureaucracies, people who have long-term relationships with that and binding, has a consistency to it and it acts in the world as an agent or as kind of agentically. And I propose, less obviously, 
that the deep state and the insurgency are also in conflict. That was another major proposition. And I would say that we've seen that. And we've seen in the, in the context of the Mueller investigation and the penumbra around it. It's got to be another term that describes the Russiagate, but it's probably the term that this used. I don't know, but I'm semantically assuming the word gate will be attached to it in Russia at the beginning. Um, I believe with the FBI putting together some notion of, what was it called, an insurance policy. Like This is just a peek into what's obviously machinations of, of the sort that will always be happening. It's inevitable. People are doing things, and they will do things within the scope of their agency. But we've been watching that play out over a couple of years. And if you have a sense of the way that these kinds of things tend to play out historically, um, from my perspective, it's kind of been on script. Like you, you see the kind of thing happen that you saw with uh, Russiagate, and you see with the Mueller report emerge. And what you haven't normally seen is the recipient of that treatment continue to kind of just bob above the surface. And there's clearly something about Trump himself as an individual that has very, you know, he makes uh, Slick Willie look uh, like um, Velcro. You know, there's a, there's a, a lack of, of friction in, in him, which is, is notable. But also, I point out the concept that the insurgency, because it's operating in the context of this decentralized medium in a, fl a very flat graph, has what's called an OODA loop that's very rapid. And that means is, this is a concept from military theory or strategy, observe, orient, decide, act. And, so, and then obviously when you act, you do something in, in the world, and then you observe again to see what happens. And the proposition is, is that broadly speaking, the more bandwidth your OODA loop has, which is to say the more information, let's say you can push through the OODA loop faster, both combined, the more a strategic capacity that you have. So more or less an OODA loop with higher bandwidth will outcompete an OODA loop with a lower bandwidth. And the proposition is that the insurgency is tapped into something, a network decentralized collective intelligence that is running a much, much faster OODA loop than the deep state. And the deep state is, we might think of them just like very simply, the deep state is running 50s, 1950s Or the blue computers. church, or both? Well, we're gonna to go to the blue church next. And the, right now I'm just partitioning them as part of a story of, of these things going to deeper and deeper levels. So yes, but right now we're on the deep state. Um, so we might think of the deep state as running you know, 1950s era server farms. Like have you ever, ever seen what those look like? Just big rooms full of ENIAC machines with tape drives. And they're big rooms and lots of them. They've been doing them for a long time. And they're controlling all kinds of like uh, big lumbering robots. And the dinosaur metaphor is quite appropriate. And then the insurgency is connected to a bunch of 14-year-old kids on cell phones on 4chan. Very quite literally. And now we have the metal metaphor. It's smaller and has less focused capacity to deliver significant directed energy, but it's faster and it's extremely responsive. So as the deep state sort of winds up and fires off its, its agenda, so for example, the concept of fake news, if you wind back the clock, actually emerged from the deep state before it was co-opted by the insurgency. It's a very specific moment where you saw it come out through sort of the ordinary channels, and then what happened was that the, the insurgency co-opts it and converts it and begins mutating it so rapidly that you could just sort of see the deep state sort of out back in its heels wondering what the hell happened. And the conflict has been locked since then. And of course, in the meantime, over the past several years, the deep state's been mutating, it's been evolving. Those strategies that don't work are being dropped as trying to find new ones. And different groups are coming in to try to form something happening on this side, but it's all still more or less running the basic code of the deep state, which is to say running the blue church, right? So we'll get there. And then on the insurgency, it of course has also been evolving and mutating and gathering. And so the IDW emerges and QAnon emerge, from my perspective, as examples of, the, of, of something happening more in alignment with the essence or more in alignment with the grassroots characteristic of, of, the, of the generator function that's coming up. Right? So the Trump insurgency, from my perspective, is a, a phenomenon, kind of like a cork floating on a wave. And you know, the wave came and it's been able to ride, or actually a surfer riding on a wave, it's an even better metaphor. They've been able to figure out how to ride that wave and surf it and, and show up as having directionality and agency on their own, but it's the wave that matters. Um, in some sense, we can kind of skip the globalism piece because it happened that fast. I mean, I remember way back in the day when things like the, uh, 
Trans-Pacific Partnership had a characteristic of really seriously scary, how the hell are we gonna stop this, fight this kind of a thing? And they just woke up one day and it was completely gone. And of course we've seen the, a lot of the machinery of globalism has just been, I think NAFTA's gone. It's just amazing the rapidity with which that's been evaporated. And I think that's largely because it never really established a strong position in, in causally. So the globalism was fundamentally still a, an American to a lesser extent EU function. And so as the forces of, of decentralization have been happening at, the, at this level, this doesn't have a whole lot of, of its own coherency. And so I continue to believe that that will continue to evolve. And of course, that's an area that has anyone who understands the history and um, political theory is reasonably concerned because any shift from a hegemony to a multipolar structure generally goes badly. It doesn't always, but it generally goes badly. That doesn't mean that multipolar structures aren't themselves able to achieve stability over periods of time. But what it does mean is that the shift is tricky. And so to the degree to which we are watching something where the notion of an American hegemony, which was in some sense showing up as globalism, the neoliberal globalist consensus, is breaking down and there's a move towards multipolar nationalism or something else. And by the way, I don't think that's stable. Um, we're in a moment of, of, of significant potential risk I mean, small movements. If anybody decides they want to reach for the brass ring, um, then it creates a cascade of conflict. So then we have the, the last front, which is the culture front, the culture of war. And here I talk about the blue church in its, uh, and its specificity. And my prop proposition is the blue church is deeper than, the, than these other ones. So it's, it's closer to the center of what's happening. And on the, on the other side now, I talk about the red religion, which is, is deeper than the insurgency. It's closer to the essence of what's happening. And both of these are happening at the level of culture. So here we have to actually think about how culture manifests itself up into causation. But maybe we'll get there in a second. So just for clarity, we're talking about the, the blue church. What I'm talking about, or what I propose that means, is a certain way that um, culture is able to be and do in a context. Right? So the Blue Church is a given, very specific instantiation of this kind of thing. In, the, in an essay I wrote about the Blue Church in particular, I called out, for example, the, the Victorian consensus, the Victorian synthesis, as something of the same kind, same kind of organism, cultural organism, if you'd like. Um, and that over the period between World War I through the end of World War II, that collapsed and a new one formed. And there's a whole bunch of things that go inside that box, but broadly speaking, you have things like how uh, media technologies enable uh, groups, large groups of people, to be able to make sense together make choices together and act effectively together. Right? So basically forming an OODA loop as a group. And um, so the Blue Church was that sort of thing. And its characteristic had to do with this sense of broadcast, a sense of whether you're talking about in school, there's a student, so there's a teacher, and there's a bunch of students, so asymmetry and passivity, one unidirectionality. So agency lives in the center, in the broadcaster, and reception lives in the in the receiver, and there's a lot more receivers than there are broadcasters. Um, you see that basic topology show up over and over and over again over the period of the second half of the 20th century. And the Blue Church is, in some sense, built around that or uses that as a primary component. It's maybe like the skeleton, the muscles of the Blue Church are that. And we've talked about the who, like who are, who are characteristic representatives of the blue, of blue church or are what we call them archbishops in the church. And again, somebody like Harvard, an entity like Harvard would be an example. The State Department would be an example. Particularly like Kennedy's State Department would be an example. And you can see like how much those things connect. A sense of meritocratic verticality. NASA is an example of a blue church organization. Uh, meritocratic verticality and then uh, GE like Six Sigma highly efficient, effective, bureaucratic actuation down. 
And that's that kind of a structure. Uh, GE would be a classic example. So notice that a lot of these examples are 1970s, right? So the blue church was at its highest and its most clear and pristine in the late 70s and has been in a process of um, decline since then. Uh, decline both because these kinds of systems have a built-in, like a rust or a, uh, atherosclerosis. They, they become uh, burdensome in and of themselves and become less efficient just on their own. Um, they're also subject to various forms of corruption no longer they're around. And in this case, the underlying basis, the, the source of, of, of a lot of the structure of the Blue Church, i.e. broadcast media, has shifted. Right? So the Blue Church is suffering from three distinct maladies simultaneously. And it shifted to this new place. Right? So we have something where we have an old, mature, strong, well-functioning, I mean, not well-functioning, but long-functioning structure, the Blue Church, which actuates, for example, through the deep state and through the mainstream media that is in a, a state of decline. And then we have this new emergent thing, the red religion, which is in a state of ascension, trying to figure out how to do stuff. And I think the developmental metaphor of a, of a, of a biological organism is quite good. If you take a look at the age, you might say that the blue church is, say, in their mid-80s, and they've been smoking and drinking a bit much. So it's not a healthy 80s. Um, and then the, the red religion is maybe 14. And so that's kind of, the, that's a good sense of the shape of it. Um, maybe not the 80s, maybe they're in their, even their late 60s, but it's not a healthy 60s. There's something about that. And so, so what is the red religion? The red religion is, first of all, red. And I need to kind of dial in on why it's red and what that means for its long-term evolution. So before we get there, I want to just talk about religion versus church, and then we'll talk about blue versus red. So the churchliness of the blue church was most of what I was talking about. It's form, the way it shows up. The blueness, the content, is, as far as I can tell, a little bit of just an accident. That over the period of the 20th century, when blue, which in the U.S. kind of represents the political left, um, and red, the political right, ran into each other and conf conflicted, Blue won the culture war. So by the mid-80s, um, Blue had won, and it was in the process of then propagating itself out into the social field. So most of the engines of the Blue Church are running Blue code, running, running Blue content. They tell Blue stories. They have Blue values. It's actually more to the point. And while there was, in the 50s, for example, a Red Church that was running Red, um, that's more or less gone. And so, so now I switch quickly to the notion of a red religion. Religion, then come back to redness. So the idea of religion is this idea that there is less formal structure. It's like the Protestants versus the Catholics. It's a much more of a peer-to-peer, bottoms-up, grassroots, spontaneous formation, building up something that maybe looks like structure, but is actually made of, of sand that can fade right back and go back out into the, into the dust. And this, of course, is the natural way that organization will happen in something like the internet, in something like a asynchronous, symmetric, decentralized, and by the way, digital communications medium. And so you see the, the meme wars are a great example. Right? Meme wars in the blue church look like Madison Avenue. Right? They look like a small number of potentially quite talented individuals trying to figure out what will sell and maybe using focus groups to, to hone their message and then firing it out with a lot of intensity through all channels. Right? Whereas what the meme wars look like through the red religion is um, self-organizing, self-assembling. Essentially everybody is participating and they kind of bubble up and certain ones, certain means that kind of vaguely go in the right direction get picked up, mutated, replicated, disseminated, picked up, mutated, re replicated, and disseminated and what works is sort of naturally grasped and felt and evolved in real time. And by the way, in the process of evolving in real time, orients attention in the organism towards those streams that evolve those that won. So a good example would be the NPC meme maybe from... A good NPC meme is fantastic. I mean, think about it. If you watch it, and you can, we, can, we, we live in a digital world, you can literally just zoom back the clock and see it emerge. Right? There was a, a tweet from a gamer using the NPC metaphor. Don't be an NPC, which to gamers means something very obvious and simple. Right? Don't be something that is driven by non-agency that has, by the way, 
sort of characteristic stupidity and simplicity to it. They're just ruined scripts. But the because a lot of people in the red religion, whether we are gamers, I think it landed and then it got picked up and it hit, it stung. There was something about it that generated an effect. So it was both on this side, in the red side, it was felt as, yep, that makes sense, that, that lands, I get it, I, I kind of grok the essence of it. And then, oh, these guys don't like it very much. I press, press the attack. And so it was a spontaneous formation and, and then it spread. Huge amount of energy was pointed to figuring out how to modify it and, 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 and move it into deeper and deeper levels of effectiveness. And by the way, effectiveness in the sense of like being cool, figuring out how to be the one who innovates the thing that everybody else picks up. Oftentimes, by the way, anonymously. So it's not being cool and becoming an, a, a, a centralized point, but I don't know, being cool, like just in the, in the moment. Um, and then also what is uptaken, what sticks and, and, and uh, goes in. And of course, as we watched it over a period of very briefly, like two weeks, it dominated. And it dominated the entirety of the social media environment to the point that centralized structures like Twitter uh, had to modify their basic rule structure uh, and roll out entirely new approaches to try to combat that thing. Right? And of course, this is the, the classic example of trying to swat you know, 100 million flies. A whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole. Well, whack-a-fly, because there's hundreds of millions of them, and they're stinging. And okay, you just wiped out the entirety of the NPC meme. Who cares? By the time Twitter had moved to swipe it, the red religion had already moved on to something else. And, and the damage was done, because now, you remember Julian Assange's point way back in the day when WikiLeaks came out, that bureaucracies are already dead because to the degree to which they are subject to negative risk from leaks, they basically have two choices. Well, three. They can either just take it on the chin and then ultimately lose because they're subject to negative risk. They can endeavor to constrain leaks, which means significantly increasing the internal policing, or they can radically reduce the amount of communication they engage in. And in any one of those three cases, they're shrinking their sphere of operations dramatically. Same basic idea here. Right? The idea is that the OODA loop of the insurgency is moving so rapidly that when something like Twitter moves, it's actually hurting itself more than it's hurting the insurgency. And basically the insurgency is using its capacities to cause the blue church to punch itself in the face over and over again. Question that comes up, like, the insurgency and the red religion, are they synonymous? Ah, they and, al and also, yeah. because you, you mentioned the IDW, like, would you identify that as part of the insurgency? Great, yeah, so if I think about it as like layer cake, layers up, the red religion is more basic than the insurgency. The red religion is at the level of values and the level of strategy. The insurgency is more at the level of purpose, at the level of goals. It's endeavoring to do something. Um, you may even say the insurgency is a level of aesthetics, like sensibility. And so the insurgency is a manifestation of the red religion, which is itself a manifestation of just religiousness, which I was trying to describe. And in that sense, the IDW is also a manifestation of the same kind of thing, which is to say it's showing up as a bottoms-up, self-organizing structure that is powered by the wave, by the energy of this new kind of medium, what this new medium makes available. Um, and as such, it is a natural ally. So I, you could say that it is part of the insurgency unconsciously. But remember, I made a distinction between the Trump administration and this thing down here, which is by definition decentralized. Right? So it's not a, there's no point on which you could say that's in charge. So to the degree to which the IDW is doing this kind of thing functionally and effectively vis-a-vis -vis the mass media, then it is acting as part of the insurgency and it's an expression of religion. And now here's where it gets interesting. So this is actually a really nice point. So remember I wanted to focus on the difference between the redness and the religionness piece. So the redness is again, kind of a historical artifact. Red was the loser of the last war. So they weren't distracted by trying to run old machinery. They didn't have any old machinery to run they were given the beautiful opportunity to have to learn new things. And so the value structures, the sensibility, the, um, even the dispositional types who were disempowered by the loss of the culture war of the 20th century found themselves in a evolutionary, under evolutionary pressure. And so they therefore more rapidly figured out how to begin playing the game in this new space, playing the 
religion game as opposed to the church game, playing the network game as opposed to the broadcast game. Um, and I should mention, by the way, they also evolved mimetic defense mechanisms. They, you know, the, the same tools that had been used in the culture wars of the 20th century, calling someone a racist, for example, um, which still kind of decimates people who are from the 20th century, has very little impact on people who are truly coming from the grass. Like 4chan doesn't care at all. Like it doesn't have any impact at all. So there's two distinct things. Like one has to do with the semantic, emotional language games that happen. And the other one has to do with the OODA loop organizing collective intelligence piece. And the redness of the red religion has to do with the artifact of a particular dispositional group, kinds of people with backgrounds and values, found themselves having to figure out how to new, use new tools. They figured out how to use those new tools and then began to have some success. Initially, by the way, in Gamergate, as far as I can tell. I mean, there were obviously even earlier examples. That was the first time that I think we really saw the red religion have a certain self-consciousness or a win a, win a fight, <laughs> that's probably better put it. And notice that they want to fight, um, surprisingly. So this begs the question of, could there be a blue religion? And of course, does it even need to be red or blue? Because in many senses, the notion of red and blue is itself an artifact of kind of the landscape of the past century, the last two centuries, something like that. And if you go back far enough, that idea doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Maybe for 50,000 years, but at some point it dissolves back into the, the, the basics of humanness. So obviously there could be a blue religion. It's, it's sort of no question. And then 2019, I pointed out the fact that perhaps with AOC, we're beginning to see the emergence of that. Right? So there's a blue content, blue narrative, blue story, blue values showing up, expressing themselves, but now expressing themselves in a way which is very, very, I would say obviously different than the blue church. And so AOC and Nancy Pelosi. She's an insurgent in the democratic, in, yeah. in, in, in blue. If She's a, 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 a blue a, insurgency. Blue insurgency. Yeah. Um, and operating in the same sensibility as the red, but because of the different valence of the typology of blue, the dispositions, the values, the aesthetics, and in the relationships and the position where they actually, have, actually happen to be, it shows up differently and will continue to evolve differently. It's a different kind of organism in this new environment. So sort of the difference between, um, I don't know, a jaguar and a crocodile. Right? Both are predators, both happen to live in the rainforest. They're quite different because they have different origin stories. And neither will do well in the desert and both are very effective in their particular sub-niche of the broader uh, ecosystem. Okay, so then we can kind of move to the last piece. Uh, when I wrote, was writing those pieces, I actually wrote it four fronts and then line, and then here's the deeper story. So now we're kind of to the deeper story. And of course, the deeper story is all of the superstructure that we're talking about, even culture, but certainly media and bureaucratic institutions and globalism and particular political parties and particular political candidates are in many ways ephemera. They are, they're, they're, uh, they're dust in the wind in the context of the bigger movements that are happening underneath. And you know, historically, we've seen this happen many times. I think a nice one happens to be the kind of the 15th, 16th century transition around the Gutenberg Bible. If you want to just use media as one line, right? the shift of the, the church in the classic sense to everything that followed after, you know, science, capitalism, the nation state, and the line that happened there, um, you know, a lot of stuff changed. You know, feudalism shifted to a completely different political structure, economic political structure. Um, you know, religion shifted from Catholic, meaning truly universal, to meaning one among many competing narratives and stories and structures, and et cetera. And even underlying human concepts of the nature of lived reality. You know, the Copernican Revolution happened in that context. Um, the Darwinian Revolution happened in that context. Right? So there's massive shifts are happening, and we're in a circumstance that is at least as, if not more significant in terms of the magnitude of the shift from this broadcast style to this decentralizing style of media, and therefore the culture that will emerge on top of it, and therefore the institutional structures, economics, political structures that will emerge on top of that, um, is going to undergo at least as much of a shift. Right? So we're looking at a massive change, and the changes that we're seeing up here are just kind of evidence of it. They're, uh, 
know, if you're pulling some sort of boat through the water and all you can see, the boat's invisible, so all you can see is the waves. We're seeing those are the waves, and then even the bow waves. And we're looking at, okay, here's the boat that's making them. And so, for example, um, in this kind of context, red and blue begin to become very problematic. You start to see a lot more possibility of uh, smaller chunks. And we're already seeing that. Like we're seeing, for example, the, the balkanization of blue, which is sort of naturally going to balkanize anyway, but showing up as having lots and lots of little sub-communities that are perhaps looking to find coherence in and of themselves. And there's a really nice essay that was written, um, Culture War 2.0, I think so, Peter Lindbergh, where he just enumerated a list of like 13 or 15 of them and how they showed up. And some seem... Mimetic tribes. Mimetic tribes is what he called them. Yeah, it's a very nice term. Which is hilarious, of course, because it begs the question of what does mean even mean to you? And what mimetic tribe you're in will in some sense answer that question. So we start getting some very interesting self-referentiality. Of course, that's where we are. The, uh, you know, the postmodern condition all the way down. And, and so my proposition, and in fact my prediction, is, is that the, the story that we're watching is going to be a story that continues to see an increasing movement into balkanization and fractionating, but fractionating at the level below culture, fractionating at the level of how we make sense of reality at all, and fractionating at the level of how we collaborate and come together as groups of people at all. And by the way, fractionating in, in these in, in massive proliferations of agency, many, many, many different ways to actually shift and change reality uh, that will be mutating and evolving at a accelerating pace because to the degree to which we have one shift, the shift from broadcast to decentralized. Notice also the shift to decentralized carries with it. It is both a product of and an accelerant of um, technological innovation, collective intelligence that has the capacity to change its own environment. So this move is not just sort of a move from A to B. It's a move from A to B-ness, where B is actually a dynamic process that is in, in, implicitly accelerating. And so it's a movement that's kind of like static to accelerating. That's a very different gig. Or let's say velocity to accelerating. Feudalism to velocity to acceleration. And I think there's actually a group called accelerationists who I don't know very well, but I imagine I just recapitulated certain things that they believe. Um, and so, well, I mean, once you kind of settle there, you say, okay, well, what does that imply? It implies a lot. And we can kind of go through that if you'd like, but that's the end of that story. That situational assessment ends there. And going back to sort of the blue church, and there's a sort of sense in, in the article, it's breaking down increasingly quickly. I mean, the Covington story was a, real, was a real moment where I think a lot of people sort of looked at the media and thought, wow, it's, the picture that's being painted by the media is so off and so clearly dysfunctional but you date it a little bit further back. You date it to the Kavanaugh hearing. I do, yeah. I, uh, my, my sense was that it was kind of the, the last ride of the Blue Church, uh, the, an effort to bring full churchly power to bear on a thing that is the topic and subject of churchly capacity, Supreme Court justice. I mean, there's very few objects that are more centralized and more concrete. You know, we're talking about a, if, you're, if the metaphor is the blue church has the feeling of like a big heavyweight boxer who can punch hard, um, this is somebody just standing there with their chin, punch. And what happened? They had to actually shift their agency into the blue insurgency. So at that moment, the blue church did the thing that happens all the time. If you look at politically, they brought in the mercenaries. Right. They brought in the, the folks who are not part of their churchly structure intrinsically as allies. But if you watch what happened in Kavanaugh, all hell broke loose. Right. The church suddenly was not in charge. They did not control the narrative, which is kind of their thing. And, and they lost, but the losing wasn't what mattered. What mattered was they had to give power. They had to actually give the game to a different kind of force. Begin Can you to explain that? that? Um, what, what was the force? I ah, didn't see that. The, the hashtag resist, hashtag me too, which are much more of the blue insurgency 
John Roberts, in fact, has said quite specifically, from his point of view, you have the insurgency, and then you have um, hashtag resist, right? And these are two blue, red, and they're coming from the same source and energy. And you know, my point of view happens to be that there's a lot of threads going on, but I wouldn't disagree. And so what ended up happening was they, they moved this from the kind of the Clarence Thomas situation, that dynamic, to a dynamic that suddenly was happening in real time, in public, on social media, and was being f not just fueled, but then driven by the energy of the grassroots coming up. Just like meme warfare that I described before. Uh, the stories that were emerging were happening from the bottom up, and they were being upregulated in a decentralized fashion, and to some extent, and somewhat clumsily and uh, uh, awkwardly, the, the, the people in the church, you know, Nancy Pelosi and uh, what's the lady from California? Um, so obsolete that I can't, I, I don't even bother to store her name anymore. She was recently in another meme where she told a bunch of kids, uh, don't tell me what yeah. to do. I'm, I'm the Diane boss. Feinstein. Yeah, Diane Feinstein. Like very clumsily trying to imagine that they were steering this ship, but obviously not at all. Right? They were on the other side of the waterfall riding the turbulence and it didn't take them where they wanted it to go. Do you have a sense that the, the Blue Church broke decisively during Kavanaugh and then Covington, for example, was, was the flailing around of a broken sense-making system? Yes, to be sure. I think the, the metaphor is, um, I remember Nietzsche actually had this really great quote where he talked about the idea that you know, Buddha died and they showed his shadow for a hundred years. Something along those lines. Right? The, the, or the idea that, I remember as a kid hearing this story that like a dinosaur would die, but because its brain was so small and far away from the body that it, it wouldn't even know it was dead for like some meaningful amount of time. Something like that. Right? The blue church, the back is broken. It is no longer a vital, living, homeostatic organism. But it still has a lot of energy. Right? So it's flailing is a good term. Its actuating capacity, its OODA loop is now spiraling. And so it's going to increasingly, actually a really good example here would be a drunken fighter. And so at Kavanaugh, it reached that threshold point where it's actually a drunkard at a bar who for whatever reason keeps drinking, where it's no longer actually in control of its actions. It's suddenly unconsciously reacting to the environment and it decides it's a really good idea to try to punch the bouncer. And that's, that's uh, Kavanaugh. And then, and then it drinks some more. It's now bleary eyed and it's swinging wildly. And as events are coming at it, its responses are increasingly obviously what they are. Right? And a lot of the Blue Church's power lives in fantasy. And remember, television has this characteristic of creating a fantastic sensibility. We project ourselves into a world that is not actually the world that we're in. Right? For me to believe that I am watching what's happening in the video has a feeling of it being present. But you, know, you reach forward and you touch the screen, you don't touch the face of the person. That's not 3D reality. And of course, even more characteristically, I'm watching The Avengers, which is really, really not reality. And yet, particularly for contemporary humans weaned on that from childhood, it maybe feels more real than, than real reality. Right? So the Blue Church, a lot of it is based upon that ability to invoke an instinct and a habit of fantasy, to tell a story, to have everybody orient their attention and choice making based upon a really well told story. And it's kind of, you know, the, 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 the king is obviously not clothed. The story no longer has stickiness. It's sort of too obviously a story. And it's too obviously a narrative that's being created and forced down your throats through channels that are no longer even particularly effective at doing it. And somewhat silly. And it's, you know, it's, it, the, the best metaphor is actually that awesome show, I, I believe it was Anderson Cooper, but I'm not sure exactly at a hurricane where you have an image of him standing there like holding the microphone and the wind's blowing and he's like up to his chin in the water and then you realize that it's all a fake. It, the whole thing's a setup. There's like two people walking by in rain boots. The wind's not even blowing very hard. Right? You're like, holy shit, it's a set. This is the news trying to show me an actual event in reality over here and they are bald-facedly just creating a movie set. Okay, great. Now I know where we stand. What's reality really look like? It's kind of like that. So that's the shift. And so the consciousness of that being the case and the instinct, the habit of, okay, every single time I encounter anything vaguely churchly, I have to assume 
that it's an extremely deliberate intent to manipulate and probably coordinated in some fashion. You can obviously come up with your story. It's what Eric Weinstein called kayfabe. Yeah, yeah. Um, although it's not clear to me that it's kayfabe in the sense that it's not clear to me the Blue Church knows they're faking. <laughs> they may have, you know, uh, they've been drinking their own Kool-Aid. They seem to believe a lot of their own stories, which is weird because they're also clearly, you know, making things up. So hard to say, but somebody somewhere is playing kayfabe on that side of the story. Um, so then when you get to something like QAnon, right? So what happens with QAnon is that if you come at it with a perspective, particularly if you come at it with a blue church perspective, it's either going to look shh, like... So just to, just to, for yeah. someone who maybe doesn't know what QAnon is, can we just recap exactly what it is? It's an alternative narrative about, so it's kind of a, either a conspiracy theory or an alternative narrative about what's going on that is being sort of generated by either someone or some group of people on the internet? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a fair articulation. The way I would say it is, there's a, a place on the internet called 4chan, and it has a characteristic of being both ephemeral and anonymous, meaning that posts are made, text images, and they are attached to a truly anonymous identity. There's no particular way of finding out who it is. And there's an ethos of having of not trying to tell people that you are somebody. And it's on these boards that have a finite number of potential posts. And then once the board is done, the board is done and a whole new board has to be created. So there's a ephemeral and anonymous character to this place, which is to say it's really close to the essence of the kind of stuff that gives rise to this religion or this decentralized network I'm talking about. And October of 2018, I think, no, 2017, some posts showed up. And that board has all kinds of crazy shit on it all the time. It's sort of known for just being crazy shit all the time. But some posts showed up that claimed to be uh, having a particular inside knowledge about what was going on, in a time frame, by the way, where what was going on was quite confusing to a lot of people, and had a, an aesthetic of asking questions, provocative questions, as opposed to giving answers and telling stories. And memetically, remember this idea of the red religion identifies and upregulates things from the bottom up. Um, this kind of worked. Some attention was paid. Some people seemed to think that was cool and it got disseminated. And then some more posts showed up. Now, of course, you can't ever prove that there's actually the same person or group of people. That's the whole point. It's anonymous. But the same aesthetic was used and so some attention was paid to it. And then it got bigger and bigger and then it got kind of big in that very small, well, in that sub-community, this small portion of the internet. And then there was some pair, uh, all kinds of craziness started to happen and it began to percolate out more broadly. It started getting called Q. Uh, anon is just a term that refers to the fact that 4chan, the chans are anonymous. Um, and then a, a layer, a penumbra started gathering around it of interpreters and upregulators and people who are trying to make their own name on the basis of this meme and try to turn themselves into internet celebrities on the basis of something else. Twitter followers, YouTube channels, begin to build around it. And if you look at the center of it, the thing that was going on in the chans, there was in fact, in the center of this stream of questions, a narrative or set of narratives, answers to questions that were beginning to form. But notice the interesting invert. Instead of it being built around answers, a narrative that was giving you the answer to the question, this is what happened here, it's actually built around questions that opened up and generated an arbitrarily large, like a vast panoply of narratives. Like the, particularly for the first six to nine months, it was hard to explain. Um, epistemologically unbound, like what could be true wasn't even centered, much less what was true, right? So the number of stories that were being created was vast. It was a huge uh, foam of narrative. And since then, over the past six months, kind of like religions do, it has begun to become more orthodox. There's more of a, here's the story, and has a counter narrative feel to it. Um, so that's QAnon. So the place that I think is most interesting is not its mature and one might say sort of desiccated modern current form, but rather what was going on in that first year or so, the, the point where it was exploding. And if you look at that first year or so, it looks insane, like almost schizophrenically insane. The number of things that were being proposed and the way they were being proposed and the rate at which change was happening was not the kind of thing that happens in 
meritocratic hierarchies and could never possibly have been handled by a single mind. But it didn't fly apart. It actually held and gathered a meaningful amount of people who put their energy and time into it. And while the signal to noise ratio was pretty low, or the noise is high, there was in fact also meaningful signal, like real stuff was figured out and actually real predictions about future conditions that were more accurate than was coming from CNN were also done. Not that hard, I mean, it's a low bar, but in any event, it actually happened. Now the proposition that I'm making, which could be wrong, right, but the thing that I found most interesting is that in something like QAnon, you're actually witnessing an even more fundamental version of the natural form of the collective intelligence that is bound to this new media environment. So if you look at the IDW, the IDW is a little bit like what happens when the churchly structure becomes a little, like takes it, puts it, lets its hair down, you know, chill out, you know, be a little bit more flexible, be a little more open-minded, um, you know, come down, whereas QAnon is coming up. And so if you look at both of them and say, okay, well, what's the distance between them? That distance, that's the distance that needs to be covered for the religious function, the new decentralized collective intelligence to close the gap, All right? When something like QAnon, something with that much flat, spontaneous, self-organizing capacity is able to generate a level of coherent thinking that the IDW has produced, well then, you're on kind of the other side of something. And if, if QAnon is the first manifestation of a new collective intelligence, what do you think the next one might look like? I should mention, by the way, I don't think it's the first. Um, Bitcoin, for example, is also a manifestation of the same basic driver, but it's uh, notable and obviously very early. So um, what was the question? What's next? Yes, if it's an early collective intelligence, what, would, what do you think the next one would look like? And will it be even more virulent than QAnon has been? It will, by definition, be more virulent than QAnon. If it is not more virulent than QAnon, it is not the next one. Um, now there's going to be an intermezzo where lots of experiments are going to be tried around the horizon. And if you look at the QAnon horizon, there's lots of different ways of thinking about it. Like, do you think about it as a really powerful psyop? Do you think about it as a really powerful propaganda device? Do you think about it as a really powerful way to gather a lot of people to do your bidding by manipulating them? Or do you think about it as a really interesting new way to do collective intelligence and sense making? Right? There's lots of different versions of what might happen inside that space. And I would actually be surprised if we haven't already, if, if call it the children of QAnon, haven't already happened. Mm. In the, call it the bad side. Covertly, there's likely already been a number of different experiments trying to figure out how to extend whatever the hell happened there into some new kind of effective tool in the war on sense making. Right? So in the war on sense making piece, I'd be surprised if we haven't seen something um, that is learned from QAnon. On the sense making side, like how do we actually make sense together piece? The most important part is going to be some level of epistemological maturity. That's going to be the decisive factor. And what I mean by that is being aware of how sense making happens. Being conscious of how your own sense making has happened, how you're showing up in terms of sense making. And then being mindful and deliberate, intentional about how one might go about collaborating in a decentralized, bottoms up, experimental fashion that has a good epistemology behind it. I think that's the decisive factor. So while there may be some, uh, <laughs> it's quite funny actually, if you, use, if you use the blockchain as an example, remember you had Bitcoin, they had this kind of cascade of Litecoins, altcoins, that were more or less Bitcoin Junior, like variations on the theme, but they weren't that interesting. And then had Ethereum, which was actually a very, like a whole new kind of idea. So there may be kind of altcoins in the QAnon space, but the next thing, the next real decisive innovation in that space is going to be something of this sort, something that has a self-awareness to epistemological capacity and is bringing that into its design. And do you think that will emerge from the chans, from the same place that QAnon mm. came from? That's a very good question. <laughs>
It is not particularly likely, but it is not impossible. This is because the Chans are a highly chaotic and very open environment and are in fact capable of absorbing novelty at a relatively high rate. The individuals who typically spend time in the Chans have a relatively immature epistemological foundation and so as a consequence will not naturally be attracted in this direction. But if it does gain traction, it can grow. Because there has to be certain characteristics of the space where a collective intelligence could be created. And that doesn't feel like Twitter. It doesn't feel like Facebook. It doesn't feel like that. What are the minimum, what, what kind of space mm. is required for that collective intelligence to evolve? So, I mean, so the chance is a particularly, is a particularly interesting right. Petri dish. So you're, provoking me into having a little bit of a uh, dialogue around the nature of how the characteristics of a medium give rise to certain kinds of collective intelligence at a, a detailed level. So for example, you can compare the chans to Tumblr and notice the distinctions and notice how identity forms in Tumblr and notice how um, social currency shows up in Tumblr and notice how identity forms in the chans and how social currency flows in the chans. Um, they're different, right? Their characteristics at a low level are different. Reddit, different. Uh, Facebook, different. And there's the difference between what happens when you have a like button and you don't have a like button. Even when you have a like button that has the ability to do hearts and smiley faces and just a thumbs up, right? There's these minor differences actually make a difference in terms of how collective intelligence naturally forms in a space. So. The question you're asking is actually quite profound. What might be a kind of space that is conducive to this form of collective intelligence? And the first thing that comes to mind is it will almost certainly not be purely virtual because the kind of thing that we're looking for is not available intrinsically in the kind of ephemeral, virtual, weak links, connections that can happen on the internet in disembodied communication. So, plausibly at least, we're looking at something which is a RL-VR combo. Something where you actually have embodied relationship. Real life virtual reality combo. <laughs> Sorry, it's real life versus virtual reality combo. Um, that's able to have the bandwidth of interaction to explore epistemological novelty well and find ways to achieve collaboration, achieve effective uh, collective intelligence in a space of extremely high epistemological liminality. Then that could be extended through virtual means. But It seems to me plausible, but very unlikely that something like this can be formed in a highly virtual environment. And certainly unlikely for it to be formed first. Like it might be copied. Once the basic notion perhaps has been generated, you might see it copied. To use software as a metaphor, if you think of, let's just make QAnon version 1.0. It's not, but let's just normalize there. If you look at, say, version 1.5, I can see something that's, that would happen in the domain of the rationalist uh, epistemology, which would have game theory as a primary basis and therefore would be a, an allegiance with the, the blockchain community. And that would be able to achieve a very high level of collective intelligence through virtual channels. You might even consider that it to be a perfectly viable version too. And it would have a mature epistemology that would be able to be reasonably functional in the new place. So it wouldn't have a evolving or novel epistemology, 
that we have a mature one that would be effective in the context of decentralized collective intelligence. A little bit like Sesame Credit, if you know what I'm talking about, the, the Chinese social currency structure. Topologically, these two things would be roughly identical. And so what you would end up seeing is a potentially very rapid proliferation of a new form of collective intelligence that could, by the way, be quite, quite intelligent and effective, but it would, it has a finite lifespan. It would actually achieve a closure and collapse event in probably a relatively rapid time, like maybe even years, almost certainly decades. And I th by the way, I feel exactly the same thing about what's happening in China. So I think China is going in that direction and you should expect to see a significant increase in collective intelligence followed by a collapse. Difficult to recover from collapse, by the way. And so to the degree to which you see something like that emerge in the, um, call it the analytic tradition, the blockchain, crypto space, decentralized, but trying to figure out how to make sense from that direction, you would see something of that same sort. It would have an S-curve, the S-curve would have significant, it would be a hell of a lot better than the blue church. So it would win a lot of ground but it would have a natural end and collapse in its life cycle for reasons that I can explain if you'd like, but that's sort of the first sense. You mentioned in passing the other day that even in Hollywood, there's a sense, I mean, there's a, there's a sense that a lot of us have that we're kind of running out of either novelty or running out of, um, like all the possibilities are being played out in almost every single medium simultaneously. Yep. Um, is that true? I mean, it just seems like watching Hollywood films now, they're, they're increasingly derivative. There just seems to be, we're going in increasingly smaller circles. It's cocaine. It's very simple. When you have a system that is designed fundamentally to maneuver people around by manipulating them at the level of their um, incentive structures, uh, particularly their neurochemical incentive structures, then what ends up happening is you, have, you get more and more competition for, for controlling you by your dopamine and serotonin response curves gets pretty narrow and it has a half-life to it. And so I have to give you more, I have to give you more. It has to become more pure and more intense and just run that across every dimension. So it's that curve, um, which by the way is the same, more or less the same curve I was just describing, but in a different domain that we're witnessing in these frameworks. So Hollywood, you know, every movie has to be more visceral, more melodramatic and more intense in both of those dimensions. You know, we can't just have conflict on Earth, we have to have conflict in space. We just have conflict in space, we have conflict in space and time. We have to act, the entire universe has to be up for grabs. And it has to be up for grabs in the loudest possible way imaginable, over as many hours as I can pin your ass to the seat, so that the effect that you used to get by watching a guy on a table going like this, lands. And it's just that, it's the cocaine effect. Um, or that's what I used to call it. And is that the same thing with social media? Yes. It's the same fundamental dynamic. And remember, it's a fundamental dynamic that's happening two-dimensionally, meaning it's happening in the sense of my ongoing addiction to Facebook, and it's happening in Snapchat's desire to move me from Facebook to Snapchat. So it's a co-evolutionary competitive dynamic to yank me around by my limbic system. And where does that go? That ends up playing itself out. Oh yes, absolutely. It's terminal. Um, it's either big T terminal, meaning that it leads civilization to some sort of hard collapse and reboot. But just think a drug addict. Just use that as the metaphor. You hit rock bottom. You either die or you have a moment of clarity and you know start moving in the other direction. That's that's where it goes. Um, in our case, as with a drug addict, um, it's quite challenging because the tools that we use to make sense of what's happening are the tools that are in fact addicting us. So figuring out what's going on is particularly challenging when the things you use to figure out what's going on are the things that's going on. Uh, and so this is why reboot, liminality, unplug is kind of the first step. And I mean unplug not just from like Facebook, I mean unplug from thinking in the way that you currently think at all. Like reboot the whole thing, all the way down to just kind of sitting around staring blankly. And then very slowly, it's funny, the software metaphor is perfect. If you've ever had your computer system really seriously jacked by uh, hackers, 
uh, you have to put things back very carefully. Particularly if you actually have to put it back. Like you can't just burn it to the ground and get a whole new system because it's not quite clear whether you have malware in a particular subcomponent. So you just have to be very careful to take things step back by back. Now, we actually have a really nice opportunity. So we have a, a necessity to go through this reboot process because of the aforementioned hacking of our limbic systems and the coevolutionary game theoretic dynamic that means that the hacking is not going to stop on its own. Right? The, the pusher addict is a dynamic that doesn't have its own, like the pusher is never going to be in position because as soon as they give up, there's another pusher. Right? So that's, that's got its own logic to it. So we've got that. We have a necessity in the, in the sense we have to get off that train. But then we have an opportunity, which is because the whole fucking world is shifting from one fundamental way of going about doing collective intelligence to another, it turns out the entire structure that has been hacked is obsolete anyhow. So we can move to the new one. And the new one is, well, at the very least, it's different. So a lot of the old hacks aren't going to work in this new, in this new domain. So if you actually allow yourself to really free your mind and settle into a very, what I call the bottom of the U, which, for example, Buddhist meditation gets you into that level of just emptiness, and then from that place, begin to recreate some new way of making sense in yourself and then making sense together with other people. Um, you have the advantage that you are also almost completely immune to most of the techniques that come from this previous location. It has a sort of a downside, which you can't watch TV anymore, but I guess that's what it is. <laughs> but there's no point in watching it anyway if it's all getting played out and in ever decreasing loops. Yeah. It's true. I mean, it's sad. It's kind of like to find out what happened to Captain America, but it is what it is. <laughs> cool. Jordan, thank you. Yeah.